We are live. Welcome to the RV Repair Club and our go live for January. Uh, it is a blistery cold day outside and we're expecting a massive snowstorm coming so it's hard to talk about RVs at some point. But I did just get back from Chicago. I uh, did the uh, NMMA show, the National Marine Manufacturers. They have a boat, RV and strictly sail show in McCormick and it is a huge place and the, a lot of the new 2020 units were there. Um, great show to have, good attendance. Met a lot of uh, RV Repair Club members and uh, we had a good time, a lot of good seminars. So uh, with that, I'm going to start off. We have a few questions already listed here. I guess uh, just introduce myself. My, my name is Dave Solberg, Managing Editor, but you probably know that since you've already joined the site up here. So we have Robert that is uh, 1995 Terry 30G. What gauge wire should I run? Oops, I got a little pop up there that came up. I want to refresh. Should I run about 20 length? There you go. Uh, to the, from the converter to the batteries, about a 20 foot length of wire uh, would be enough. And most of the wire manufacturers, you want to you want to kind of match what you have in there. And uh, I would say that you're probably going to be able to get by with a a, a 10 gauge wire going on it. But uh, the best thing would be to go to an automotive store. And see if you just can't get the uh, battery cable that would match the positive and the negative. I guess that you're, you're going to both uh, portions of the converter to the battery. And they'll sell it usually in bulk, um, encrypt the ends for you. Or And I, and I would definitely look at uh, doing some type of a manufactured end that's crimped rather than, you know, you can buy bulk wire and you can get the small little terminals that you you bolt down, but uh, they're not real secure and they corrode pretty easy. So if you can if you can get a pre-made um, crimp end on those, that's the best thing to get to eliminate corrosion. Jerry, my Class A RV has been in storage for several years. How do I get the plumbing system ready? Um, well, the plumbing system shouldn't be an issue really because you're, you're basically uh, you got a city water fill and lines that go kind of bypass the water tank and the wa uh, fresh water pump and they go to the faucets and then you have a fresh water tank and the, um, the uh, uh, water pump itself. I would say I would probably take the water pump screen out. Um, I was just looking, I have a pump but I don't have the screen here with me but just let me grab that pump real quick here. So this is going to be your pump. It's going to be mounted in the compartment wherever you have your fresh water tank or service center. And, and on the incoming side of this pump, and it looks like on this one it's going to be sure flow. So it comes in, there's a little arrow here. So it's going to come in through here. On this side of the pump, you will have a screen. And if it's been sitting for several years, I think, uh, you know, the first thing I would do is actually um, replace that screen. Just make sure you're going to have calcium rust. If there was any water left in it, that water's probably going to turn pretty black and skunky. So the next thing I would do is put um, a water solution, a bleach solution with water in the fresh water tank and run it through the pump and all of your uh, interior connections. One of the things you want to be careful is that, that uh, if you did have any water in it and it froze and it cracked the line, you don't want to put a whole bunch of water in the fresh water tank and um, have leaks all over the place. The other thing, you could have had rodents. Mice got in there um, and chewed some of the water lines and, and hose, holes in that. So I guess the first thing I would look at is to probably uh, put a little bit of water in the fresh water tank, uh, turn your pump on, don't open anything up yet, and just see if your pump cycles. If it goes prump, prump, that means that somewhere you've got a leak and it's allowing pressure out and you got to pressure regulator in here that says start up push more water so that's telling me I have a leak somewhere um, once you verify that that's all good then just run I would say you know you put in about 20 gallons of water um, in your in your system and then uh, um, with that probably two to three cups of bleach in that water system uh, the other thing is if you got an electric water heater some of them do LP and electric. Do not start that water heater up without water in that heater. 
probably, if you winterized it properly, you pulled the plug, drained the water heater, opened all the other valves too, so make sure all your drain valves, your low point drain stuff is closed, and then just run that bleach solution through that and just get it nice and clean. That'll sanitize it. You will have a little bleach taste in it. Uh, they do make bleach that has a little more of a, not, you know, not perfume, but you know, less of the chlorine taste and, and a little more um, acceptable taste for it. My wife hates the smell of bleach, so we use that um, and stuff. I would be a little more concerned about if the unit's been sitting for years in storage, more about um, your roof to sidewall joints, your sealants, your, your leaks, your tires. You know, there's a lot of stuff that sits for two or three years. Your slide room mechanism, the seals around that if you have those. Just, you know, operate everything slowly. Uh, this would be a good product to get, this Protect All. Um, it polishes, waxes, treats, but it just hits your seals, your rubber gaskets, all that stuff. Um, then really, really inspect your roof to sidewall joints on the, um, the, the sealant that's used in that um, up on the top and just make sure you don't have a lot of leaks in that thing. The other thing, um, I would get a little uh, can of fluid film. Fluid film's a product you can get at O'Reilly Auto Parts. I know Menards sells it. Uh, I think Home Depot has it. But it's just a spray lubricant. Um, it's a great rust inhibitor, but it's also uh, good for the joints in your steps and any metal places that are gonna move around um, that'll help lubricate those up. So some, some precautions you wanna do since it sat for a couple years, uh, things could start to rot pretty good. Um, William Carney says, I recently had rodent damage in my electrical system to the tune of $800 in electrical repairs. What do you recommend for replant, probably repellent? Uh, mothballs are no-no for us. Yep, yeah, a lot of people use the mothballs, but man, the thing smells like crazy for months on end. Um, th there's Cab Fresh. Uh, I have had um, several people have used that and been very successful with it. There are several mouse traps. If you look on our site, we've got several videos on different types of um, traps that don't kill, some with poisons, uh, a variety of different things. Even the ones with poisons, they have some that are designed so no pets can get in there um, at all. And one of the best things out in the market is called uh, Mouse Free, and it is a spray that they guarantee you will not have rodents for a year. It is a little expensive. Uh, you do have to apply it with a a pressurized paint gun, like an automotive style uh, paint canister gun, which they do sell, or you can take it someplace and get it done. But it is one of the absolute best out in the market. And if you paid eight hundred dollars for electrical damage, um, you know this is going to be uh, way less than that. So, um, good product to get. It's it's a uh, mint based. I don't know if it's peppermint or spearmint or what it is, but mice hate that minty uh, taste, smell, whatever, and the you know, you can't just put that stuff on like a, like a mint um, extract or something because it will dissipate really fast. So they've come up with a proprietary way of mixing it with something, whether it's a Teflon or I'm not sure what it is, but it actually stays on for at least a year. That's, that's the key, that it won't dissipate. All right, let's go here. Let's see where our... So Joe Zaho, I'm hoping I pronounce that right, Z-H-A-O. Uh, it would be interesting topic to talk about how to prevent rodent mice damage. Could you elaborate a bit on this topic? Does insurance companies cover this type of damage? Um, well, and the insurance part, that's a good question. I think we've already covered the, the mouse topics. Um, and I just thought of something too. One of the RVs that we work on quite a bit, it's a 2000 Brave. They put dryer sheets all over on the inside. Now, some people say that doesn't work for them. They have never had any mice in there. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Get back to the cab fresh and the and the uh, traps and the um, uh, what I call it, mouse free, uh, are good ones. But the insurance uh, that is something that you definitely have to find the insurance company that's familiar with RVs and and have that written in the policy. That's a big problem with uh, insurance in the RV industry. Is too many people call their home or auto and they just say, I bought this X amount of dollar unit and they get this blanket coverage. And there's so many things that aren't covered because they don't happen in the, art, uh, the automobile world or the home in industry and stuff. So you really have to look at the progressives and the nationwides 
um, and find an insurance agent that is, is a specialist in RVs, like Farm and City Insurance. I bring them up all the time. They're out of Fourth City. They've uh, um, basically designed the RV insurance programs that are out there back in the 60s and 70s when Winnebago was taking off because they were right in their hometown. So check, check with a good insurance policy. Um, newer, 2017 Jayco Melbourne, Class 3, I'm assuming he says Class B, RV, roof cleaning and reseal ideas, please. Try to find videos on your site with no luck. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I know there's a, I know there's videos on there. We've done a, a lot of videos. Um, you probably have with the Jayco, uh, a rubber membrane material on the top. It's either TPO or EPDM. Now, EPDM would be the cheaper one. And the way you can tell is if you go inside and take the cover off your um, vent, you've got a square roof vent fan up there and it's got just a little cover with some screws. If you take that cover off, you'll, have, you'll see some um, extra material tucked inside. So they bring the material over, they cut an X around it, they fold it down in and cut it back. If you look on the back side, if the color of the material is black, then you have EPDM. It doesn't matter what color the top is, but black means it's EPDM. If the color is the same as the color as your top, whether it's white, beige, or any other color, then it is TPO, that's the new generation. And if it's fleece lined, then it is uh, Alpha Systems. And I believe Alpha was just purchased by Lippert here uh, recently, but um, uh, EPDM and TPO, they recommend cleaning with a light detergent. Dawn dish soap is one of the best you can get um, in water. It's very environmental friendly, but it's also very good on tars and oils and so forth. Um, and then you want to find a conditioner that is made for your type of material. Now, Alpha Systems, they recommend that you clean it with Murphy oil soap and water, and that's a cleaner and conditioner. So they have a little different method of it. But I know we do have a, a good cl a class on it, uh, the external, external uh, maintenance on it. And uh, I do know that we did a, a video on a fifth wheel cleaning that entire uh, unit um, out in the hot sun. I remember, I remember it well. But um, take a look on, on the site again and just you know, maybe put in uh, roof maintenance uh, might be it. But those are the ways you want to clean and condition that roof. Okay, hi Dave, what's better for washing the RV? Lamb's wool or synthetic wool mitt? So not to scratch the clear coat, thanks. Um, I think, you know, most people use the microfibers now. You, you have the, the rags, uh, you can get the brushes. Um, you know, uh, if you wanna get really expensive to make a horsehair brush. But I think both the lamb's wool and the syn synthetic wool mitts uh, are good. The biggest thing, in, in my opinion, those are both very soft. They won't scratch the clear coat unless you get dirt and grit on and in the mat uh, or mitt or towel or brush or whatever you're using. So the first thing I would recommend is to you know, wipe it down, hit it really good first and get it really wet and try to get all the loose dirt and grit off of that because then that's what's going to scratch most of your clear coat um, when you're doing something like that. So I, I think either one of those would be good. And again, you get into Dawn dish soap. Um, now one of the things you might want to do is um, Phylon, whose Chemlite um, makes the fiberglass outer skin on almost all the units out there, and uh, they recommend to wax the unit with a Meguiar's uh, wax that has Carnauba uh, UV resistance. The only thing I would rec I'd be very careful on is don't wax the decals. Most of the decal companies say do not wax those because it will encase them and make them dry out faster and crack and fade. So stay away from the decals still until I get word back from them, um, from them on doing it a different way. Ah, Captain says, I have purchased a 2018 Jayco Alante with very few miles. I don't think it was used very much. Anyway, neither slide moves out smoothly. I silicone sprayed the seals. Is there something else I can do to make it go out smoothly? On occasion, I have to push the slide when it starts to stick going out. Thank you. Well, um, the first thing I would do, and we've brought this up many, many times, is bring the leveling jacks down, level and secure the coach. 
Um, and some manufacturers are saying not to do this. They want you to run the slide rooms out in a relaxed state is what they call it. And I have contacted all the mechanic, um, the um, mechanism companies. There's Power Gear, there's HWH, there is Swing Tech, Quickie, Lippert. All those people that manufacture the actual slide mechanism say level and secure the coach so you have no twisting in the chassis, you have no twisting in the sidewall. If you do it at a relaxed state and you're out of balance a little bit or out of level, now you are forcing that room, that mechanism, that motor to work harder than it was intended to do. The second thing I would do is check your battery power. House batteries, lead acid batteries, are very susceptible to sulfation. When you drain the battery down to 10.6, sulfur attacks that plate. When you're recharging it back up, if you don't have a multi-stage charger that breaks up that sulfation, it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And it may work okay when you're plugged in and you're doing your normal RV stuff you know, inside, but then when you go to run that slide room, it's really pulling some amps and that battery can go and then it's just it doesn't have quite the power for that motor to push it so uh, the next thing I would recommend is when you're sliding that room out just put a battery charger on not just plugged in get a battery booster and put it on your house battery just see does that make it slide better if that's the case then my batteries are, are you know not able to hit that amp draw that's being pulled off those motors and it's just not those motors that are not going to run to their their specifications the next thing that i would do is instead of silicone spray i would use this on the seals but now the seals aren't really going to do much about resisting the room from coming in and out except that flap on the side and that's not going to do enough really to to you know make that room run in and out slower and then since you didn't tell which slide it is, um, neither slide moves out smoothly. Slide, I'm not sure if you've got a, a hydraulic slide or if you've got a, um, a cable slide or an electric slide, but check with the chassis, with your um, manufacturer and whoever makes, whether it's Power Gear, Lippert, and the type of slide that you have and what they recommend for lubrication. Now, you don't want to do WD-40. Uh, you don't, there's, there's a, a lot of things you want to stay away from, but some of them do have a rec recommendation for lubricating certain points. Not everything, and you really have to be specific. Uh, take a look on our site. We went through several of them on, a, uh, on some Lippert systems, what they recommend for lubrication um, and cleaning. And I think if you do those things, you'll probably see it's going to run a lot more efficient. Ah, okay, so I got Jerry came back. Thanks for your response on the plumbing. What about the sanitary systems? And I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot about those. I would do the same thing with the sanitary stuff. I would run some bleach down through it just to start getting it, um, getting it cleaned and sanitized. But then the other thing I would do is I would fill the black water and the gray water tanks about three-fourths, just enough to at least get them up over the probes on the side of it, and then throw in a bag of tank blaster. And I don't think I have one of those here with me, but Thetford makes a product it's called Tank Blaster. It's just an envelope with an enzyme cleaner in it that you put in, and it will foam up. You leave it overnight, and it cleans really, really well. So what I'm, what I'm looking to do is to clean those uh, monitor panel probes inside so they don't give me a false reading. Then once you dump everything out of there, uh, Thetford al excuse me, also makes a variety of valve cleaners and protectors. So you have a spade valve that is going to allow you to dump that tank and it has a rubber seal around it. So just, just put a little bit of that after the fact and let it sit in there and it'll just make that seal nice and, nice and pliable. Um, and then really inspect your hose, your drain hose. Uh, it might be, if it's set for a couple years, might be a good idea to get a new drain hose. There's a couple out in the market. Uh, Thetford has a really good one they just brought out that we've featured um, in some of the videos. So uh, those are things I would do for the sanitary system. Guest 8966, RV Sway. Have the Reese hitch with round bars and sway control. Okay, so the first thing you want to do when you're looking at trying to keep a, a trailer 
from swaying or highway hop or whatever it is, a lot of people just throw on a set of equalizing hitches or sway bars and, and expect it to just, boom, automatically be right. The first thing you have to do is go weigh the system and take, go to a cat scale at a Flying J or a Pilot, um, find out what's my GVWR of my trailer, that's the gross vehicle weight range. That's the max that trailer can weigh with everything inside of it. So you go to the CAT scale and you've got a first pad here, you put the front wheels of the tr truck on it, the drive wheels on the second, <clears throat> and the trailer on the third, and that'll tell me my trailer is X amount of weight. The second thing I do is I want to find out proper tire inflation in that, and if do I have the proper tires? You know, if you have underrated tires or you have cheaper tires with light sidewalls, that sidewall is going to move around um, on, the, on that unit and you're just going to keep fighting that stuff. The only way to find proper tire inflation is to weigh the coach, go to rvsafety.com, that's the RV Safety and Education Foundation, find your tire manual for your tire manufacturer's manual and is it dual or single application. It's not the number on the side of the tire, it's not the number on the tongue of the tire, it all has to do with the weight of that rig matched to the tire manufacturer's chart. So get those things and then, and then the next thing I would do is I would weigh, now that you've got the three components, drive around, unhook the vehicle and weigh just the truck on the first and the second axle. Find out what weight rating you have on that back axle. That's very important as well because I need at least 10% on there and I don't want to go too much over 10%. So I, I may have too much weight on the front end. I may not have enough weight on the front end, especially some of the smaller vehicles that you see out in the market. Um, after that, the next thing I would look at is your truck and what kind of suspension on the truck. Uh, there is a product out in the market that, you know, um, Bill Plemons out in North Carolina, and if you go to Bill Plemons RV, I think they might have it um, on their site. He's had it at the shows. It is a uh, leaf spring enhancement. He is pitching it to completely replace the sway bars um, on the rig itself. I, don't, I haven't used them well enough yet, but what I do know is it's an enhancement that goes on the leaf spring, so it kind of keeps some of your truck sway because you're, you're naturally going to have, with leaf springs on the back and your tires, you're going to have a little bit of a, of a sway out of that vehicle, and some are worse than others. This completely eliminates that. Now, that might be something in, in conjunction. It's, it's kind of an in effect, in, in, inexpensive fix to it, but I would do all those things first and then take a look at your sway bars and get in touch with your RV manufacturer and just talk to them about you know what what is the recommendation or maybe even the sway bar company I'm not sure if you got Campco or Blue Ox or who it is but uh, you know those things first you can't just throw sway bars on and completely eliminate a chassis that isn't up to it manufacturer specs to start with um, okay you did say you had a Reese hitch I'm sorry with uh, round bars and sway controls so um, I would get in touch with Reese and 85 Southwind Eagle One, what's the best way to reseal my RV windows? Um, well, and there's, there's a couple different, when, when you say reseal the windows, and I'm not sure if they're dual pane windows and they're fogged in the inside of the dual panes, there is no good way to reseal those. Uh, there are some companies that, that will take them out and recondition and do them, but it's almost the price of a new, um, new window anyway and but you're more than likely you're talking about the actual seal around the window to the sidewall itself um, in 85 Fleetwood used butyl tape most everybody used butyl tape it's kind of a putty type of a, a tape and that window frame sits in the opening and that's on the inside and just kind of squishes it in and then they reseal or, or the cap seal they call it you really don't have to uh, with silicone so what I would recommend is first thing, uh, if you do have some leaks in there, probably the best thing is to take the window out and re-butyl seal that whole thing. It's very easy to go inside, you have a series of screws on the framework inside, take those out, the frame comes out and it's just a small little ribbon frame. Uh, either have somebody hold the glass on the outside of it or tape the glass to the sidewall and then go out and just pull that windshield window out 
clean off all the butyl CO, clean off the old stuff, clean off your sidewall, get it nice and, and clean before you reapply some new butyl seal, pop it in. There is a video on the site. We did that on a, um, a trailer. Um, I believe it was last, last winter maybe it was. Uh, anyway, but that should be posted on site. But it's a, a fairly easy procedure to do. You can cap seal it if you want. Uh, make sure you get a silicone or a sealant that is compatible with fiberglass or whatever the sidewall of your rig is. 85 could be, um, I'm not sure if Southwind switched in 85 to fiberglass from aluminum. So if it's aluminum, get a sealant that is compatible with aluminum. Any suggestions for a good performing directional TV antenna? Yes, WineGuard. WineGuard makes a variety of different uh, products, some of them that you can upgrade your old Batwing to. Uh, some of them are, are new products that you, you put on. The first one is if you've got the old Batwing, you can get a Wingman, which is just an additional piece that helps um, fur get further distance out of your, your, the signal you're trying to get. The Batwing will still work with a digital signal. Um, even though it was built in the analog days, it will get one, but the difference between digital and analog is that digital has to have 100% strong signal, otherwise it'll pixel and drop. So you get about half the distance out of those old antennas. The second thing you can do is take the antenna top off of it and put a raise air, and it is just kind of a, a big uh, flat panel that uh, has two-sided antenna, so you can get two different directionals out of that, and it, it still has to go up and down with your bat wing. Uh, but it does fit in and get you about twice the distance. Uh, the next thing you could do is take that completely off your old antenna. Uh, they do make a permanently mounted antenna, um, the Razor series, that will fit in the same hole that your bat wing was at, and you can directional it um, as well. The step up from that is to get the uh, round dome. They got a 360 plus and a uh, Another one that we're going to do a video on, but we did a video on their, their traditional model. And it will go into three different, it automatically finds the, the towers for you. So you go in and do a, an antenna search and it will start in one position and goes to three different points and finds. And it'll say searching, found, 23, um, 23 towers. And then you just do a channel search on your TV screen It'll find all the towers in this point, and then it'll move to here, and it'll find all the channels, excuse me, in this point, and then here. So, um, you know, those are your options to upgrade from price points to least expensive to the most expensive. Um, hello, Dave. We are on vacation, and the first stop we tried our slide and cable came, whoops, just jumped ahead on me here. We are on vacation, and the first stop we tried our slide and cable came undone. Should we call a mobile service, and how do I choose a reputable company? Uh, what, you, what you really need to do is make sure you get a hold of somebody that is familiar with that cable slide. It's either going to be a Lippert or a um, BAL AccuSlide. We do have a video um, on that and how to replace the cable. If you go online to find out what the brand is, and, and you should be able to do that by going inside, and the motor mechanism for that cable slide is usually up above. Uh, typically, those are, are bedroom slides, so you've got a big um, head, header on the top of it, and kind of hidden behind that will be your, your motor, and then there's a series of blocks and cables, and then they go out to pulleys, and they go down, come in, go out, and so forth. And so, um, you know, you can, you can do that, but I would, get, I would uh, find, if you can find a, a local uh, RV service center that is familiar with that, you should be able to override that and push that back in so you don't have to have a mobile service come out, which is going to be very, very expensive. I, I would say if you have the ability, push that thing back in, um, and, and you don't have to worry about it coming out, just push it back in and then uh, you know find out where the where the local if you're on vacation hopefully you're staying in a campground somewhere maybe the campgrounds almost all have some service center that they have made relationships with to get that stuff repaired and um, you know if it is the bedroom slide too one of the options is just leave it closed once you get it closed excuse me 
leave it closed. I get swimmers here. Um, leave it leave it closed, and and uh, you know you should still be able to function the rest of it. Um, again, not being there, I can't really see for sure, but there's some options for you. Good luck with that. Too bad it happened on your vacation, um, but at least it wasn't. It, it it's not something major, so that's a good thing, and, and nobody got hurt. Um, David Horn, we have a 2020 Rockwood Ultralight 2707 WS. We have had it since May of 2019. After we brought it home, we compiled a list of 20 things which were not right with the RV. Some things were fixed, but not all. It is in the shop again to fix a few more things. One problem being the cabinet doors falling off. My wife and I toured the facility before we bought and we thought we saw a quality RV being built. I want to know what happened to the quality. That is a, that's, that's the million dollar question, uh, David, and it, it's one of those things that, um, you know, not knowing, at Rockwood makes a variety of different levels of products. Um, you know, they, they make a nice product, but there are some, some uh, inexpensive materials used in some of that stuff and some of the framework. Um, you know, the biggest thing in units like that is that uh, the, the dealer should have really taken a, a very good look at that unit when it first came in called a pre-delivery inspection and walk through that whole thing, you know, the cabinet doors. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, something that's very, very hard on RVs is when we let them sit outside and the temperature just changes and we get them down below zero and we let them get up above 120 degrees and, and it's very, that's very challenging on materials as they expand and contract. Um, you know, it's it just, every RV manufacturer is gonna, when, when you have a unit come out, you're gonna have some stuff to adjust. Now, not 20 things like you're seeing, uh, that's unfortunate, but I would definitely get a hold of Rockwood and get everything documented, get, get a representative down there to take a look at it, have them explain. You know, you went through the factory and the pitch was quality, 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 yet well, it's here, you know. Um, my dad does tours for the Winnebago still and, and, you know, he pitches the same thing and people see the same thing and, you know, for the most part, uh, it, it holds up very well. Every once in a while, you you might run into a little something that's all human error and, uh, but again, the, the big thing is the dealer should take care of that right from the, from the start and not keep having these problems. So sorry you've had that. Um, you know, I've seen the quality in the RV industry really, really has Im improved, um, you know, here in the, in the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, back in 2008 when the recession hit, just prior to that, they couldn't make them fast enough. And, you know, there were some issues, but, uh, you know, I haven't seen that much. So I do... Uh, I do hope you get these things taken care of, but call the factory, get a rep, get it documented, make sure that these things get taken care of because you will be out of warranty fairly soon and you don't want any of this stuff lingering through that. Yes, the Black Seal, Jennifer, Jennifer says, what, uh, and she says, okay, thank you. So you're talking about the, uh, and it's called Butyl Seal, Butyl Tape, B-U-T-Y-L, Butyl. Uh, Edward, I have a 2004 Damon. The black rubber around the outside of the window seems to have shrunk. How hard it is to replace? Same thing. That's the butyl tape. Uh, you need to take the window out. And, uh, you know, basically what's happened is that is a putty kind of tape. The more, is, the more it is exposed to the sun and the heat and the temperature changes, it's going to expand and contract and it will eventually sink, shrink, crack, so forth. So. I would say take the window out, apply new butyl tape. You should be able to get that at, uh, you know, there's a variety of different places. I, I think they even sell at home improvement stores used in some of the um, construction area as well. If not, any dealership can get it for you. Edward, nope, that was Edward. Steve L. Dave, love the live events, but I'm unclear when they occur. They are on a regular schedule. I usually miss them when I just get an email with a couple hours of notice. Thanks. Steve, we do them once a month. Um, we, we don't have, you know, it's not like the second Tuesday or Wednesday or th whatever of the month, mostly because of my schedule. Um, I do a lot of shows, um, and the shows kind of float back and forth, so I have to change the dates. Like I said, I was just in Chicago last week. Um, in fact, this month I started off January, uh, the first weekend of January, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, Chicago this last weekend. I got home one day, left one day, got home 
uh, Monday morning at 2.30 in the morning here this week, and next week I go to Charlotte, and then I have a final one in, uh, excuse me, Greensboro was the first week, and then I go to Raleigh. So they are supposed to send you a notice a few days ahead of time uh, if you are signed up on our emails. And I know um, my wife has signed up just as a free, um, you know, free registration just to kind of get the notifications. Um, you know, so she sees that they're coming and she says, oh, I see you have a live event this week. Sometimes I forget to tell her I scheduled them. So, <laughs> no, not me. Yes, Diane, I admit it. Um, but anyway, uh, they should be sending you a notification. And maybe what we can do is, uh, um, well, it's on, the, it's on the Facebook page too. It, I, I know it pops up a couple days before the Facebook. But that's a good suggestion. I'll get that to them and, and see if there isn't a way we can maybe get a little more notification out there um, that they're happening. Because uh, I'm sure I'd, I'd love to see a lot more people on, um, you know, on these and, and asking the questions. Um, what is the best source for load range G and H tires for fifth wheel RVs? My toy hauler was supplied with an E range tires and I had two blowouts the first trip with our motorcycles. So uh, this is Al Albin, Albino Castro. Um, anyway, so you know the first thing I would do instead of jumping right up into the, low, the G and the H is uh, go get your RV weight. Go go find out. To get it to a CAT scale, and find out exactly what that unit weighs on those tires. Get the right tire pressure, like we talked about beforehand. Go to RVSafety.com, pull the tire charts for your your tire manufacturer. But just jumping up to a G or an H load, you're masking a problem that's happening. Those things should not, um, you know, if they came from the factory with your E range, then they they should be able to handle that weight. And it may be too that you have more weight on one side of that vehicle than the other side. So let's say I put it on the CAT scale and I've got a GVWR of 14,000 pounds and I'm at 13,200 pounds and it's like, okay, maybe that's okay. But I also have an axle weight rating and an individual wheel position rating that that tire cannot go over. And you know, one of the things in the RV industry people don't realize is that just because you have huge storage compartments all over that rig doesn't mean you can fill them all up. And so you need to find out what you have on that side. Were both tires that blew out on one side versus the other? You know, you, you have these floor plans and RVSEF is the, is the expert on tires. They've been documenting this because it started out with John Anderson having blowouts on a fifth wheel and going away in this coach and being completely shocked at what kind of weight was on there because manufacturers weren't posting anything. They didn't care about weights. And so he started weighing coaches and started getting the data and making manufacturers adhere to those, those weight ratings, but they still don't build a floor plan for proper weight distribution. You know, if they did, uh, and this, this it comes straight, straight from John himself, if they did, you would have all the appliances down the center on the chassis and we would walk around the outside but nobody nobody would buy those so you have to get it weighed one of the ways you can find out um, if you are heavier on one side or the other without you know you can kind of straddle those scales at the cat sales not the best way uh, getting individual wheel position from rvscf.com uh, is the best but if you can't get there get a, a infrared temperature gun and I have one here let me grab this quick just This is just a very inexpensive little tool that we use. Uh, this happens to be a Centec that is from Harbor Freight. And as you can see here, let's see, uh, right up on there we hit that and we see that we're at 67 degrees. So when I'm traveling down the road, I take one of these with me and every time I, uh, once a day when I stop for gas in the middle of the day when the sun's up here so it's not hotter on one side or the other side, I go out and I hit the hub, I hit the brake drums, and I hit the tires. And I just record that temperature. So if it's 70 degrees outside, it's not uncommon for those hubs to be running 85, 90 degrees, or maybe even a little more. But when they spike to 130, 140, then I know the bearings are starting to get dry and need to be repacked. And that's cheaper to do it in the garage than it is on the side of the road. If that brake drum spikes, then I know those brakes are probably set up a little hot and getting getting worn. If the tire starts is, is as hot, 
I may be losing some inflation. But the big thing you can do with this as well is if I have one side of my RV that's running consistently hotter than the other side, then I know I got too much weight on this side. I need to move stuff over. And we always want to put the convenient stuff right in where the patio's at so we don't have to walk around the unit. But you're going to have to do some weight distribution. So I, I would say uh, get your vehicles weighed, weighed first of all before you start jumping up to tires because if you put H and Gs on that, and you're masking something, then you have bearing and axle issues as well. Um, if, if you want to jump up to the, the higher stuff, um, I, I don't, you know, I have a good source located here in Clear Lake, Iowa, but that, that doesn't help you out in the market, so you're just going to have to do a little bit of research. But get an, an RV rated tire, an, an ST tire, um, you know, that, that will match the size and what you have and, and the tread especially. You know, I see a lot of people getting mud and snows and things that's just gonna heat up in there. All right, so where are we at here? You might mention Okay. Virginia Johnson, is there a good squirrel proof AC on the market for a seventeen foot 1968 Airstream uh, Caravelle, and unfortunately, I don't think there is. Uh, I have a local guy here that's got a trailer that he puts a um, ADCO cover on it every winter, and he goes put the swim noodles, and he spends a lot of time getting it covered. And last winter, he had a squirrel get inside and completely chew out all the styrofoam on the inside of that thing. Um, one of the things you probably could do is there's a lot of squirrel deterrent products out in the market. If you were to go to Ace Hardware or home improvement stores over in the garden section, um, I don't know what they're based out of, uh, you know, if, if it's like a pepper, um, not spray, but, uh, you know, pepper granules. I know sometimes that does it, but there are a lot of products out there um, that can deter them. I don't know of anything on the AC side that would keep them out of there because you have to have the vents on the side of that, um, you know, that they can still get in. And uh, they're, they're crafty little things. They'll chew the, what's left of that one inch vent out of there and, and get in the inside of it and, and make their nests and do a lot of damage. But try some of the deterrent stuff. I think that, that might help. Uh, Edward, this seems to be rubber. It appears to be holding the chassis onto the aluminum frame, not the tape between the frame and the coach. So Edward is referring to, let me go back up and see, the black rubber on the outside of the window seems to have shrunk. Okay. Um, this seems to be rubber. It appears to be holding the, oh, the glass into the aluminum frame, not glass, glass. Not the tape between. Okay, so you're, you, um, in your window, you have pretty much a, um, a rubber seal or gasket that's going to go all the way around the inside of it. And depending on, it, it's, it's, I can't remember what year you said it was, but it's probably either a herd or a hair, H-E-H-R, um, uh, glass company. And if you can find the glass, the brand of that window, uh, you may be able to get a replacement gasket for that. Otherwise, you're going to have to get a new window. And the windows are pretty standard. If you just get the size, there, there's a whole bunch out there. Lippert's even doing new windows now. So you could get a replacement. And you might want to even go with the flush mount um, replacement window in there. Very easy to install. So um, you know, most of that stuff, once that, uh, that gasket starts to shrink, and it's just getting you know, basically it's getting heated up and it's getting baked and the moisture's going out of it and it's just, it's just shrinking. That's pretty common, unfortunately. Dave, you might mention to people who need internet access to not sign any long-term contracts as Starlink, an internet access system from low orbiting satellites is due to start up in 2020. Starlink.com has more, but this technology will revolutionize RVers internet it'll be interesting to see what kind of antennas will be available for our rooftops okay i did not know that um i'll have to do some some uh research on that right now you know i i don't really recommend one brand over the other um for 
internet access. Uh, I use I use a Verizon hotspot when I go. Uh, I do I do know that the campgrounds and my the Verizon hotspot that I use, you just pay for two months at a time. It's it's uh, sixty dollars for two months, so thirty bucks a month. I don't need it all the time, and uh, I just uh, it's a little small little piece that I carry with me and and. Uh, you know, so there's no long-term contract, and I do agree. I don't like the long-term contracts. You know what? We've spent more time on rather than pitching the internet provider side of things is more on the antennas, and I would imagine if the Starlink is coming into the market, WineGuard is probably um, working with them right now. They're the predominant providers of not only TV antennas but Wi-Fi extenders and and uh, so forth, and so. Um, you know, I would recommend keeping an eye on WineGuard. Not, I will contact um, Alex is my guy there, and I'm sure he's familiar with this. And we'll see. Uh, we'll see what's coming. Um, and you're right. You know, technology changes so much. And I see 5G is coming out. So you know, f I remember when 2G was the the big thing. So anyway, um, we'll see what happens. But thank you. And guest 8804. Two, how does a window fog up inside the window? What you've got is a dual pane window and pretty much in, in between those two is just an air gap. And so um, what happens is you've got a seal all the way around that outside where those two windows are at, rubber seal with some aluminum in, in there. Um, you know, going down the road, you're getting twisting, getting vibrations, those, that seal somewhere created a, a leak in there so it lets warm moist air come up into the inside of that and every time you have temperature changes it's going to start to fog it's going to get condensation um, eventually it will etch that glass in there so it, it does not go away so that's what's happening in there there are some companies like we said beforehand that will take that out and they'll treat the glass clean it all up um, you know reapply some stuff to it and treat it Usually it's more expensive than replacing the window. So that's what's happening is you're getting a, a leak in that. It's not argon filled, any kind of gas filled, it's simply air. And when it does develop a leak somewhere in that gasket, warm, moist air comes in. Larry Swoford of a 2002 Bounder 33R that my wife and I have had for the last five plus years. Since we bought it, it has always had a wind whistle that is occurring in the front tried pinpointing it but haven't had much success. We have a 6,000 mile trip planned this summer and would like not to have this irritation. Any suggestions on how to get analyzed and fixed? Um, get a really good radio. No, I'm just kidding. I've had the same thing. Um, you know, I took a couple units out six, eight months when I worked at Winnebago and we had air leaks in the front of them and uh, the whistling wasn't the worst part in my opinion. The, it was the cold air that came in and about froze me to death on a trip to Colorado. I had to, I had to wear a sleeping bag because the heater wouldn't keep up. Um, what we ended up doing with, with uh, a lot of these units that we've had air leaks and so forth is uh, we'll go in and um, put a really bright, bright light up in the front in the engine compartment and uh, in, in, in a dark room or dark area or some kind of a covering over it and just go inside the RV and look for pinholes of light coming through. That's, that's one method of doing it. Um, you know, you've got so many places things are going through that firewall in that front end. If you do have, and then you said it was a 2002 bounder, okay. If you do have a, a circuit breaker box in the front on the firewall, I've seen that at times where there will be relays or circuit breaker boxes and it does have a cover that goes over that and the foam gasket of that cover starts to deteriorate so it lets wind get into there and then make its way through the fuse box because um, you got all those wires are going to come into your steering column and various places uh, inside that RV. So, you, um, you know, another, another option is to uh, use the smoke. There is a, a smoke product out there that you can um, literally fog or fume and blow a little, you know, have a fan and, and just blow a little air in and smoke will kind of permeate uh, to the inside. To me, the, the really bright light it has been the best thing. And sometimes you don't see it coming from the outside in. You have to go inside and push it out um, as well. So anytime you can get that bright enough and to get in there in the dark, um, 
hopefully you'll be able to see something. We had the passenger side windshield replaced when we first got it, but I have attempted to reseal that again. Oh, that was the same Larry in there um, as well. Um, well, one of the things that if, if you think it might be the windshield, um, you know, there's, there's so many different places. I think maybe, probably one of the best things you can do, thinking about it now, if you do think it's a windshield or it could be the top cap, it could be the clearance lights, there's so many things that it could be, you know, do the light thing first. Find out, make sure you don't have anything in the dash and the firewall and in and, and that part, part of it. Uh, but then maybe take it to a dealership that has what's called Seal Tech. And Seal Tech is a machine that sits inside the RV with a hose that goes up to one of your roof vents and it draws air inside your RV and it basically pressurizes the inside the RV. And then they take a uh, one of the pump up sprayers with a water and detergent solution and just go outside and they hit that whole windshield front cap everything and it starts to bubble any place you have a leak so if you do the if you do the uh, the light thing first and make sure um, you know because they won't be able to spray in the entire engine and all the wiring and fuse panels and stuff like that but if you do that first and then if you still have it maybe do that seal tech thing and uh, you should be able to find it Excuse me again. Um, we got about eight minutes left, so Ron Gonzalez. Have a 99 Damon Intruder, 26,000 miles, front tranny seal leaking. Any suggestions? Um, that's basically, um, th there are a few products out that I've seen some people that put in that supposedly magically stop tranny leaks, but most of the stuff that's out in the market like that gums up everything else and then you just get more problems down the road. So um, about the only thing you can really do is, is pretty much uh, have somebody tear that thing apart and uh, you know put a new seal on the front end of that, that transmission and uh, that's pretty expensive. So if it's not a big leak, most people just leave it. Um, there's not a whole lot other uh, that you can do for it and, and it's a you know since it's such a big rig and getting it into a place that they can get it up on a hoist it's a it's a fairly expensive deal so you might want to just check with a, a local dealership that um, you know since it's a 98 99 Damon Intruder you're probably looking at a uh, workhorse or a Ford transmission, so you're probably going to have to take it to a Ford or a Chevy dealer to work on those because most of your dealerships, your RV dealerships, can't work on the chassis. They have to be done by a, um, an authorized service center for that brand. Not a whole lot of help there. Okay. Captain again. Uh, what is a good aftermarket tire pressure monitor system? Tire monitoring system. I have six tires, dual wheels in the back. Do you recommend flow through sensors or do they leak? Are different valve stem materials a problem for some TPMS sensors? I recommend the TST sensors. Um, we've done a, few, a couple videos with them and uh, I have actually put a set on a trailer that I have a side business that I have three trucks and trailers that put about 100 and 25,000 miles a year on each one of them and I put one on that I would say we're at probably 180, 190,000 miles and they still work like a dream. They still give accurate readings. They are the uh, flow through type um, on that. There are two types you can get. One of them you put on, uh, you just on the, back, on the valve stem itself and it will give you a reading but if you need air you have to take it off and push it in. The others are flow through, so you can you can add air, and they have a little Allen screw that will tighten them, so nobody can steal them. Um, but we've used them now for almost two years, and the the trailers. Not only do we we can put a lot of miles on them, um, and they hold up, but we also go into some construction sites where the parking lot's not done, so it's pretty rough terrain, and these things are absolutely fantastic. TST systems. Um, I, I think we might even have some in the store. Uh, I'm not sure if we put them in there yet or not, but 
Uh, it is one of the best ones you can find out in the market. Look for our tire pressure monitor video and uh, we did a sponsor video on them as well so you should be able to find that and get the website to be able to um, find those. On a 40 foot Class A with slide toppers, slide toppers, have to reach the rubber seals on top of the 16 foot slides underneath the toppers to clean and lubricate, maintain. Okay, on a 40 foot Class A with slide toppers, how to reach the rubber seals on, t oh, okay, on top of the slide underneath the toppers to clean and lubricate and maintain. So what he's, what he's saying is you got a 40 foot Class A motorhome, he's got slide rooms, and he wants to know how to get up to the top part of the slide room and get to, get to that back seal. Because all the way around the box you'll have a bulb seal um, up, up against the sidewall on it, and he probably has um, underneath the topper. So he probably has an awning coming out with that. And um, you know, basically about the only way you can do that is to, uh, I would say, extend the room, not quite all the way, get it about halfway out where you still got some roll left in the, in the awning. And then if you can go in and um, somehow, you know, put like a, a two by four T or some, something that you can push in there to actually lift the awning cover up and you should be able to get in there. It's not easy to get in. If it's a 16 foot, what I would suggest, those seals, if you, if you do have an awning over the top, of those seals should be very pliable. They shouldn't be dried out. They should be protected really well. But what you could do is take something like this and just take one of a telescoping pole. You can get some you know, uh, longer dowels or they even make uh, very inexpensive mops that will telescope out to eight to 10 feet and then just put a rag on the end of one of those, tape a, you know, a rag or something in it, saturate that really good with this stuff and just slide that from one end, go to the other end, slide it in and you should be able to lubricate and clean and condition that seal inside. And like I said, it should be, should be in pretty good shape already if you already have that awning on the top of it. Um, I think, where are we at? We got a couple minutes here. Somebody, Eric Bassler says, I think Starlink will use advanced special antennas that can point to a moving satellite by phase changes on small parts of the antenna without physically moving anything. Guessing you can only get it as a package with the electronics from the provider, but it uh, should look slick. So there's somebody else that is familiar with the Starlink. And Wayne Miller, on a new to me, 40 foot Class A with five solar panels installed on the roof, each about 36 by 60. How can I estimate the watts produced by that much solar surface? Should the solar controller tell me that? Yes, your solar controller should tell you. I do not have mine here with me handy, but you've got a solar controller down there that will tell you the battery condition. It'll tell you the, the um, the voltage um, and I believe the um, the watts that is it's being produced on that um, you know, right through the controller itself. It's also something you should be able to put a multimeter on, and you can get the voltage and the amps. And then I don't believe the multimeter does the watts, but you've got a formula that you can do it. But your control, your control module should show that for you um, as it's going through, especially if you have that many in there, that, that's gonna need a very advanced uh, controller, charge controller to, uh, to moderate that. So with that, I think we're close to wrapping up. Uh, that's the last, what's that? She says, wrap it up. Woo, woo. All right, well, we got a big storm coming Friday night, so none of us are going to be RVing too much. But I thank everybody uh, for coming along. I see we got uh, 150 plus or something like that. So we had a good night, good questions, great questions. And uh, we'll look forward to that Starlink and stuff. And then uh, hopefully next month, will let me know uh, how some of the stuff came out with your windows and so forth. So with that, have a great evening, uh, great what's left of the week. And thank you for joining us. I should sing Happy Trails or something, shouldn't I? Happy Trails to you.
until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. I can't believe I still remember that song. Who cares about the stormy weather as long? Now that I probably forgot. Something about when we're together. Happy trails to 